The Chicago Bears completed their so-called top 30 visit with Caleb Williams in Chicago this week. And now Ryan Poles is ready to turn in his card for the number one overall pick. You are Locked On Bears, your daily Chicago Bears podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. This is Locked On Bears, and I'm your host, Lauren Cox. I'm here to bring you your daily, in-depth Chicago Bears news and analysis. It's hard to believe I've been hosting this for almost seven years now. This will be our seventh NFL draft we're getting ready for on the podcast. Really appreciate you tuning in today and making Locked On Bears your first listen today. We're part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Today's episode is all about Caleb Williams and the Bears locking in, setting their sights on the USC quarterback with the number one overall pick after formally completing their top 30 visit. We'll look at how the Bears have gone through this evaluation process on Caleb Williams, how they've gone about turning over every stone to be as confident as they possibly can before selecting this quarterback number one overall, and just how early through this process they really started falling in love with Caleb Williams and why, to me, it, it makes it pretty clear that the the so-called debate between Caleb Williams and Justin Fields was over long before us on the outside saw it as over, long before Justin Fields was traded, long before we were debating it on social media and it tore this city apart. This this conversation was was largely over. There wasn't really that much of a debate. I don't think a debate between the two quarterbacks is not really how the Bears ever really looked at it. And I also want to look at in the context of what the Houston Texans just did for CJ Stroud and and how that informs what the Bears are going to try and do around Caleb Williams and why ultimately this exact team building strategy is what pushed the Bears away from fields and towards drafting a rookie quarterback like Caleb Williams. But Caleb finally got to come to Hallis Hall and Chicago this week. Sounds like they had dinner Tuesday night and then did the physical and went around the building and everything on Wednesday as part of what they call a top 30 visit. The sort of naming behind that is that the Bears are allowed 30 such visits. You know, their top 30 players doesn't have to be, you know, it's not like they're ranking their big board. They're only bringing the 30 best players, but they get to choose up to 30 players that they want to bring in for these kinds of visits throughout the draft process. So like the same day that Caleb Williams was there, they also brought in the Alabama edge rusher, Dallas Turner, the Oklahoma offensive tackle, Tyler Guyton, the West Virginia center, Zach Frazier, and the Miami safety, Cameron Kinchins. And I believe Thursday, Roma Dunze was in Chicago for his visit. Sounds like Malik Neighbors has already done his visit, among other players. Like, you know, they slowly kind of go through this process with guys over the course of mostly the month of April, but sometimes that starts in March and, and kind of continues on that process. So it's it's the last box that the Bears had to check for Caleb Williams. They got to do the physical. They got to get all of the medical information their hearts could desire. Anything that they wanted about Caleb, this is where Caleb said he wasn't going to give it to teams at the Combine, but he'll do it on his visits. That's what the Bears got, everything they needed in this visit. And it's worth noting, Caleb said he would do it for the teams he's visiting with. This looks like the only team Caleb Williams will be visiting with. That's not official at this stage, but it sounds like that's the only visit he's got scheduled, and he's fully expecting the Chicago Bears to take him. So no one else will have Caleb's medical, complete medical information other than the Chicago Bears. He's confident in being their pick. They're confident in him being the pick. And they've really shown that in how they've approached this whole process and the timeline for Caleb Williams' evaluation. And also, even just in this top 30 visit, the Bears did a rare thing. When the Bears took Caleb Williams to dinner, they brought current players on the Chicago Bears roster to that dinner and had Caleb sit with them, have him be a part of the team and a part of some of the leaders in that locker room at dinner. The Bears executives and stuff were also like at the same kind of at the same big table, but Caleb was sitting specifically with the former players there. So all of a sudden, like they're really immersing him in this locker room culture because they're planning on taking him with the number one overall pick. And they've been planning on taking him 
with the number one overall pick for a lot longer than just the day they traded away Justin Fields. There was some great reporting from Albert Breer from Sports Illustrated, and I believe um, uh, Mark Silverman from ESPN Chicago had put some info out there as well on like how this visit played out and how some of the Caleb Williams timeline played out here and, and how the Bears have been really aggressive about scouting Caleb Williams since long before the NFL Combine or the Justin Fields trade market or anything like that. Like the reporting from Albert Breer was that like back at, you know, the Senior Bowl and the East-West Shrine game, you know, the so-called college all-star games, the Bears were having their scouts there talk to USC players who were teammates of Caleb Williams and talk to Oklahoma players who were teammates of Caleb Williams before he transferred to USC and ask them, okay, how's, how's Caleb? What's he like as a player? What's he like as a teammate? And sure, you might expect most good teammates will say good things about their teammate and are not going to trash him to the Chicago Bears. But there's but but like not all responses in those types of interviews are created equal. And from Albert Breer's reporting, like players not only just said that the you know the usual platitudes about oh yeah he was a great teammate blah 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 but no players lit up about Caleb Williams. And sometimes in those interview questions a player might hesitate or pause or be careful about their words. Well yeah Caleb was Caleb was good. You know, you might, you might pause there. You might detect something in their answer that tells you there's more to dig in there, but that was not the case with any of Caleb Williams' teammates that they interviewed with him, interviewed with at the senior bowl at the East West shrine game and et cetera. The bears also used their offensive coordinator interview with Cliff Kingsbury to ask him about not only Caleb Williams and how he took to coaching and all that stuff, but also Caleb Williams' dad and some of the, we'll say questions surrounding his dad's involvement in this whole pre-draft process for Caleb in terms of, you know, not hiring an agent. There were unfounded and unsubstantiated rumors that Caleb's dad and him wanted an ownership stake in whatever team drafted him or that Caleb's dad wouldn't want him to go to the Chicago Bears. None of those things proved to be true. And there was, there's no mechanism for the, any for those for the ownership stake thing to be true. So like when you think about the broader timeline of this whole Caleb Williams process, that goes back to, I believe it was January 19th was when the bears interviewed Cliff Kingsbury. Well, you go back to the senior bowl was the week of January 29th through February 2nd. They're asking his teammates about it. Like that is a, a an exact full month before they even sat down with Caleb Williams at the NFL Combine and had their formal meeting in like two full months before meeting with Caleb Williams at the USC Pro Day. And you know then you get to the beginning of, of April here where we've got the top 30 visit and the Bears really locking things in. And of course, you know the Justin Fields trade was I think around March 16th, if, if I've got my dates correct here. So like they've been really digging deep on Caleb Williams for quite some time. And, and as Albert Breer and others have reported, the Bears have been comfortable with drafting Caleb Williams for well over a month, like weeks before they actually traded Justin Fields, the Bears became comfortable with drafting him. And that's really a key point that I think has gotten lost in this process. We spent so much time debating Fields versus Caleb Williams. What should the Chicago Bears do? And while we were still having that debate, the Bears had already decided. And I think we need to reframe with hindsight how the Bears approached the quarterback decision, not as much as a Caleb versus Justin debate, but more a debate over a product of circumstances. We'll, we'll explain how I think we all got that wrong by making it Justin versus Caleb when it was never really those two guys head to head. Next on Locked on Bears. This episode of Locked on Bears is brought to you by our friends at eBay Motors passion, drive, and patience. The formula for winning championships is also what keeps your ride or die alive. eBay Motors has everything you need to maintain your vehicle and level it up to peak performance. We're talking superchargers, exhaust kits, roof racks, LED headlights, and more. Whether you're into speed, power, or style, eBay Motors has you covered. With over 122 million parts for your vehicle, you'll always find exactly what you're looking for. And with eBay's guaranteed fit, your part is guaranteed to fit every time or your money back. Because with eBay Motors, you're burning rubber, not cash. 
with all the parts you need at the prices you want, it's easy to make your car the MVP and bring home huge wins. Keep your ride or die alive at ebaymotors.com. Eligible items only, exclusions apply. eBay guaranteed fit, only available to U.S. customers. We spent months this offseason either in your group chats or on your social media or uh, we didn't try, we tried not to do it too much on this podcast specifically, but debating Justin Fields versus Caleb Williams. We were tired of it. We were sick of the same debate. Every time I'd guest on somebody else's podcast or do a radio interview somewhere, it was always like, what are the Bears going to do? What do you think they should do? With, and it's like after a couple months of this, I'm just like, can we just can we just get this over with? Like, can we just move on with our lives instead of having the same back and forth debate over and over again. And we debate the merits of like, okay, well, Fields didn't have good supporting cast and Fields still has untapped potential and you could trade down from the one overall pick and get all this stuff. But Caleb Williams could be this and he could be this quarterback and be what the Bears need and you could still get value for Justin Fields. And we spent so much time debating those two quarterbacks. And, and I think for the Chicago Bears, it was never a head-to-head -head debate back and forth. They fell in love with Caleb Williams pretty early in this process. And so it was ne it was not about do we keep Justin or do we trade Caleb? It was about how quickly can we be sure about Caleb Williams? Right? It was not okay, we got to we got to really get to the bottom of Caleb Williams' talent here and then okay, we've evaluated Caleb as whatever grade this is and we evaluate Justin Fields as whatever grade that is. I don't know if the you know, numbers are down 9.6 or whatever, you know Back to, and then we'll put their two grades next to each other, the two scouting reports or whatever, and say, okay, which guy do we like better? Like, it was never about them being head-to-head. -head. There was very clearly a very early extreme interest in Caleb Williams based on the player the Chicago Bears evaluated on tape. Right away, they were interested in Caleb Williams. And from that point on, it became a matter of not trying to debate whether Williams was better than Justin Fields, but trying to dig deep enough to understand for sure that Caleb Williams is a prospect they would want to invest the number one overall pick in for this Bears team. Because think about it. The last game Caleb Williams played would have been in December, right? Because their USC's bowl game was December 27th, and he did not play in the bowl game. So the last game that they actually had Caleb Williams play in, I'm trying to pull up the exact date, because that's when that's when this evaluation process really kicked off. November 18th against UCLA. November 18th, 2023, was the last tape Caleb Williams put out there. And it was not as though November 18th was the first day, like, okay, season's done, now let's start scouting these players. Like, the Bears had been scouting Caleb Williams for years, I can almost assure you that they watched 2022 Caleb Williams tape last year. Going, like going into last draft, they were already peeking ahead. Anytime they watched a USC player entering last year's draft, they were keeping tabs on the quarterback. Teams, teams keep yearly tabs on, okay, who are the sophomores on this team? Who are the juniors on this team? You know, who hasn't declared yet, but who should we be keeping an eye on for next year's draft? Caleb Williams has been on that radar for years. And then, you know, this past season, actually scouting him in person at games, sending scouts and coaches and executives to USC games, seeing him live and in person during the season, right? There, there already had been building this evaluation of him, not finalizing anything, but building this evaluation along the way so that the college football regular season ends. And again, the last Caleb games in, in November, they've got a pretty good sense of like, generally how talented they feel this quarterback is. The evaluation's not done. They still want to see him, again, they still wanted to talk to him at the combine, see him go through the pro day, you know, do interviews and stuff. But like the on-tape evaluation finishes up pretty quickly in the offseason. There's a reason why, again, timeline-wise, they're talking to Cliff Kingsbury on January 19th. They're talking to his teammates at the end of January. You know what I mean? This is when we were still wondering what the Bears would do when we weren't sure if Caleb Williams was going to be their guy or not. Like Caleb Williams declared for the NFL draft on January 15th. You could say that's when this really, really started. But I think when Caleb Williams declares on January 15th, the Bears already know he's a guy we are highly, highly interested in as our next quarterback.
This is a guy that we think is number one overall pick caliber. And so the time between January 15th when he declares and I guess draft day, but really, you know, they've more or or maybe the time they traded Justin Fields. Again, it's not about like trying to stack Fields and Williams next to each other. It's about can, how quickly can we be confident either in a yes or a no about Caleb Williams? How quickly can we, can we be assured that either this is our guy or we're assured this is not our guy and we're not going to be willing to take him. And then you, of course, you can do the same thing for Drake May and Jaden Daniels, but like it started with Caleb Williams and never really fully came off of Caleb Williams. They did their due diligence on all the different quarterbacks. They did their due diligence on what they could potentially get for trading down from the number one overall pick. But the last three months has been all about, okay, how can we confirm how we feel about Caleb Williams? How can we get comfortable or not comfortable with him as the number one overall pick? Like, how can we reach a point where we're sure whether or not we want to take him with the number one pick? And that clarity really came at the NFL Combine, like right around that process, because while the Bears did not get his full medicals at the Combine, Caleb Williams camp provided the Bears with some amount of his medicals coming out of the combine. And that's where the bears really got that comfort level of like, okay, we don't get everything, but we got enough to say we're good because originally the Chicago bears had scheduled this top 30 visit that they did this week. Originally they had scheduled that meeting with Caleb Williams, or I suppose it was not this top 30 visit, but they had scheduled a private visit with Caleb Williams, I believe at USC after the combine, like two days after the combine, they were going to meet with Caleb Williams do that private visit and get those medicals so they were good to go. But then the Bears and Caleb decided, you know what, let's just push this back and wait till after the pro day because the Bears got the medical, the the key stuff that they really wanted. They still wanted wanted to check off all the medical boxes. They still wanted to check off the boxes of bringing him to the house hall. Still want to have him meet with teammates. Still want to do dinner. They still want to do all the things and not just skip it because they fell in love with the guy. They're still going to make sure he checks all the boxes. But they got all the like bare minimum stuff we needed to feel comfortable with him coming out of the NFL combine. And that's when the Justin Fields debate officially ended long before they actually traded him. And I think the Justin Fields debate didn't really ever happen. They were never trying to debate Fields versus Williams. They were trying to get a sense of whether Williams was the guy or not. And if Williams was not the guy, then they keep Fields. Or if Williams not the guy, then they look at Drake May or Jaden Daniels. And if none of those quarterbacks are the guy, they keep Fields. But it was always about, we're evaluating whether these quarterbacks are the guy. And then Fields is kind of like the, the backup plan there. It's like, if none of these quarterbacks are the guy, then we're, we're sticking with Fields and we're trading down. But it was never about debating Fields versus those guys. It was, let's see if any of these guys are really the guy that we like. And as soon as they are, then Fields is gone. So that's where it's not the same as just, which quarterback do we roll with, Fields or the rookie? No, it was always like, let's, make, let's see if any of these rookies blow us away. And then if they do, then sorry, Fields, you're out of here. Like that was always the process. And that's where they ended up trading away Justin Fields. Now they're able to reset the rookie, tr- the rookie contract timeline, move things forward with Caleb Williams and build around him and try and have the success that we've seen the Houston Texans now have with CJ Stroud. They went and made a big move for, for Stefan Diggs after making some other big moves around CJ Stroud. And they're kind of setting the model here. Not that you do everything they do because it's been perfect. No, but showing you the type of example of how you start building around a young quarterback and it, taking advantage of their lack of salary. And it all points to further evidence as to why the Bears made the switch from Fields to now Caleb Williams. We'll we'll make the comparison there and how this applies to what the Bears are doing with their quarterback next on Locked on Bears. This episode of Locked on Bears is brought to you by our friends at Robinhood. Did you know that even if you have a 401k for retirement, you can still also have an IRA. Robinhood has the only IRA that gives you a 3% boost on every dollar you contribute when you subscribe to Robinhood Gold. But get this, now through April 30th, Robinhood is even boosting every single dollar you transfer in from other retirement accounts with a 3% match. That's right, there is no cap on the 3% match. Robinhood Gold gets you the most for your retirement thanks to their IRA with a 3% match. This offer is good through April 30th. Get started at Robinhood.com slash boost. Subscription fees apply. And now for some legal info. 
Claim as of Q1 2024 validated by Radius Global Market Research. Investing involves risk, including loss. Limitations apply to IRAs and 401ks. 3% match requires Robinhood Gold for one year from the date of first 3% match. Must keep Robinhood IRA for five years. The 3% matching on transfers is subject to specific terms and conditions. Robinhood IRA available to U.S. customers in good standing. Robinhood Financial LLC member SIPC is a registered broker-dealer. The Houston Texans are going all in on building around C.J. Stroud right now, and it's exactly what the Bears have gotten a head start on doing with Caleb Williams and will be able to continue to do over the next few seasons because Caleb Williams will be on such an affordable contract. That's not to say that Justin Fields wasn't also on a, on a very affordable contract, but Justin Fields' affordability was really only going to last one more year. Or, you know, he was only going to last one more year if, if he didn't improve. Like, if Justin Fields got better he would cost you more. And if Justin Fields didn't get better, then he would be gone anyway. But resetting the quarterback timeline with Caleb Williams allows the Bears to do things like trade for Keenan Allen, but also do the types of things that we're seeing the Houston Texans do right now. Because C.J. Stroud has made them an instant contender, right? They've got this window where their quarterback is seemingly good enough to take them to a Super Bowl. I mean, it's a lot of expectations to put on C.J. Stroud. He had one good rookie year. I'm not ready to crown him the next Joe Burrow, Patrick Mahomes, but like, sure, he had, he had a good year, but okay, you got a quarterback you believe in, you go all out. You you not only trade up in the last draft, I guess, I guess they trade up to get Will Anderson in the last draft to get a star pass rusher on the other side, but they, they went out this offseason and signed Daniel Hunter from the Minnesota Vikings to be their two star pass rushers on their defense. They went and traded for Joe Mixon from the Cincinnati Bengals to be their lead running back. And then they went and traded for Stefan Diggs after having drafted Tank Dell last year. And then two years ago, Nico Collins, who both looked like quality receivers. You know, they didn't have this huge need per se for Stefan Diggs, but he certainly adds a lot to their offense and gives them this offseason. The, the, the Houston Texans have added a thousand yard rusher for CJ Stroud, a thousand yard receiver for CJ Stroud, and a 10 sack guy on the other side to pair with Will Anderson. Like that is how you invest in going all in around your quarterback. And now some extra details have come out about what they did with Stefan Diggs's contract that make it more like a one-year deal and maybe a little bit of an overspend in that regard. And, you know, that's some nuance that's, I mean, we're not here to analyze the Houston Texans on the podcast today, but the point being like, that's what you get with four more years of a rookie contract with the fifth year option then added on to the end where it's like, you're paying your quarterback so little that you can go out and Trade for a big name receiver like Diggs, who's going to cost them a lot of money. You can trade for a running back like Joe Mixon, who instead of letting the Bengals cut him, they traded for him and inherited his salary. That's not cheap. It's not overly burdened, but it's not cheap either. They can go pay top dollar to one of the top free agent pass rushers in Daniel Hunter. And and they also brought back uh, Derek Barnett, I believe, as well. And then, of course, last year they traded up to the top of the draft to get an edge rusher in Will Anderson and pick second and third back to back. Like these are big, bold gutsy swings that you feel emboldened to be able to do when your quarterback is cheap. Because at some point, if CJ Stroud continues at this pace at the end of his rookie contract, he's going to cash in on a really big contract, you know, 40, $50 million a year, depending on where the salary cap is, maybe even more than that by that point. And then when you go from paying your quarterback, I actually don't even know what the rookie, the top of the rookie contract salary is right now. But like when you go from paying your quarterback, a much more reasonable rookie deal. I'm pulling up CJ Stroud's contract right now as I'm filibustering here. Four-year, $36 million contract. So like his cap hit is last year it was six and a half million and it's eight, nine, and eleven million dollars. When you go from paying your quarterback eight and nine million dollars to fifty or sixty million dollars a year, that's fifty forty or fifty million less in cap space that you're gonna have. So that forty and fifty million has to come out of someone else's pocket. That means maybe you can't keep affording Daniel Hunter at that price. Or you can't keep affording Stefan Diggs at that price or other expensive players. You can only keep so many expensive players when your quarterback becomes your big number one salary. And so for the Chicago Bears, even if Justin Fields came back in 2024 and had a great season and took that next step forward, then you're paying him you know, Daniel Jones money, 30, 40 million dollars a year. And then, okay, you can't afford another year of Keenan Allen then at this current price. You know, can you afford DJ Moore? I mean, probably one of the two at, at that price. You know, can you keep affording Tremaine Edmonds at the, the price that you're paying him to pay to play linebacker? Can you keep, you can keep affording Montez Sweat, but you start to have to make cuts somewhere. Like maybe you can keep Sweat and DJ Moore, 
but like does Cole Komet's contract become a little bit more expendable there? Or do you just end up cutting off the middle class on your team where you keep all the expensive guys, but then you got to get rid of like the more affordable middle of tier players like like TJ Edwards, where you can't afford to pay another linebacker seven million. So you got to start Jack Sanborn on his rookie contract. or You got to start Noah Sewell on his rookie contract and take a demotion of, of talent there. Or maybe when Kyler Gordon's contract comes up, sorry, you just don't have the salary cap space to re-sign another cornerback to another big deal. So you got to move on from a young player you like. Or Jaquan Brisker. I mean, same kind of thing. Like, you can't afford to bring in somebody like Gerald Everett as your number two tight end at $6 million a year. Like That's a luxury the Bears have right now because their quarterback costs are low. But if you'd kept going down the Justin Fields path, your quarterback costs were about to go up if he played well. Or you accept his fifth-year option, which still would have been a significant increase on the salary that he was going to be paid this season or next season I guess increase from this season to next season anyway, it's going to go up to like, was it like 15 or $20 million a year for that one year? So all of a sudden that eats up any kind of cap increase you get from year to year. So it just becomes that much harder to build around a quarterback once his contract went up and Justin Fields through no fault of his own got through the end of his contract without the team having really invested heavily around him. And it was just a poor timing thing where you know, he gets to Chicago in year one. It's the end of the Matt Nagy era. They're still, you know, they're paying Andy Dalton and Nick Foles. And like, they weren't like all in on building around Fields the way like the Texans were with CJ Stroud that year. Like Fields was going to develop and take his time, which w- was the plan and then gets thrown out there. But then year two, the Bears are trying to tear down everything. So not really building all around Justin Fields. So he's year two of, of not really utilizing that rookie, that cheap rookie contract because you were just tearing things down anyway. Year three, they go out and get DJ Moore. They start to build around him a little bit more, but you're still paying some of the bills off from your dead money from tearing down and haven't been able to really go all in. But you know, they, they got a Montez sweat halfway through the year. Like they were trying, but you could only do so much so quickly. And Fields didn't take that CJ Stroud level step, that Jalen Hurts level step, that step forward. And so you get to this point where it's like, You got to reset the quarterback timeline and now you can do it all over again, but in a much better position to do so with Caleb Williams. It's not fair to Justin Fields that it happened that way. It wasn't a fair shake. It wasn't anything that he did wrong in that in that regard, but it's just a matter of timing. And Caleb Williams comes into much, much better timing. And it's why Ryan Poles, I think, structured it this way. Like the Justin Fields timing was unfortunate, but that wasn't Ryan Poles' pick. Ryan Poles was trying to reset everything, trying to get on a timeline that was his timeline took time to do so, and now he's doing so at the quarterback position as well. Like, you're seeing this play out on the other side of the Texans trade with Josh Allen. His contract kicks in. He goes, I think he's supposed to cost them like $16 million this year or 19 To n- Next year, he'll cost him $50 million. So they got to get out of the Stefan Diggs contract. I mean, yes, Diggs had some off-the-field stuff and some discontentment that also led to that trade, but that's part of why you've seen the Bills bleed out talent. They let Gabe Davis walk. They didn't re-sign Stephon Diggs. They let a lot of their good defensive talent go this offseason because they just can't afford to keep re-signing all these players because Josh Allen is about to cost them a bunch of money in the future. So you have to go with lesser players around that quarterback. So you better be darn sure that your quarterback is so good that he elevates the level of play of all the players around you before you give him that big contract because once you get that big contract, you have to elevate the level of play around you. You have to carry your team to the Super Bowl Once you get that big contract, that's what Patrick Mahomes has been able to do with the Kansas City Chiefs. It's what Tom Brady was able to do with the Patriots. And there's not many other quarterbacks that we've seen be able to consistently carry their team to the Super Bowl once they get that big cash in contract after this after their rookie deal. And that's where this whole process becomes that much more challenging. Like you'll see the 49ers get there with a cheap Brock Purdy. You'll get the Eagles there before Jalen Hurts' contract kicks in or the Bengals got there before Joe Burrow's contract starts kicking in. But like most of the rest of the time, it's been Tom Brady, Patrick Mahomes. I guess the Rams went all in and got a Super Bowl. The Eagles lucked in with Nick Foles at one point. Like the Falcons had an MVP year from Matt Ryan out of nowhere. Like there are exceptions, but most of the time your window is rookie quarterback on a rookie contract or I mean, sorry, young quarterback on a rookie contract or it's you have... Tom Brady, Patrick Mahomes, that elevates everyone to such a level that you can get to the Super Bowl even when you can't afford super great players around them. That's the other reason why the Bears are going after Caleb Williams. They're looking for that caliber of player. Justin Fields may have been and still could be a playoff caliber quarterback, a team that could lead you to the postseason with a good supporting cast, but they're aiming higher and they see Caleb Williams as someone with the potential to get you there. And that's what we can all be excited about as we move forward with the USC quarterback in Chicago. Let's all try and embrace this now that it's an inevitability, now that it's really locked in and full speed ahead. We don't have to debate 
the quarterback, he is your guy. Love him or hate him, he's your guy. So you might as well love him and try and get over some of this other Caleb Williams nonsense that's been still kind of swimming around there. I do want to talk about that at some point on the podcast, but that's going to be a feisty one, and I don't know I don't know if I'm ready to start fights or anything on the podcast here. But hey, we try and keep it fun, friendly, and football-focused here on Locked on Bears. So I hope that you'll hit that subscribe button on YouTube or wherever you listen to podcasts because that's going to be the best way to keep up with all of our daily in-depth Chicago Bears news and analysis. Thanks for making Locked On Bears your first listen today. We're part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Come on back on Monday. We're going to do a mock draft Monday and with some of your help. And we're going to look at some of the different draft pick combinations for the Chicago Bears, depending on what you do at 9, 75, and 122. If you go edge rusher in the first round, you got to go wide receiver in the third round. If you go receiver in the first round, can you wait till the fourth round to get your edge rusher? Like We're kind of going to kind of go through some of those different scenarios and different outcomes, depending on where you start your draft. Kind of a choose-your-own-adventure mock draft Monday coming for you right here on Locked On Bears. So come on back for that. Keep making Locked On Bears your first listen each and every day. And I promise that in exchange, every day I'll give you another opportunity to bear down.